Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. It is Friday. Yes, I am late this week. Let me tell you about my week. Um, It's been a little crazy. So I had planned on getting this episode up on Tuesday. Everything was going great. Came home from the office and the power was off in our apartment. Six hour saga of getting the power back on in our apartment. Very long story involving bills that are still in the name of um, a woman who's been dead for two years and just a lot of complicated issues of living in a different country and trying to figure out the bureaucracy. We did finally get the power back on, but uh, I have a laptop that has a battery that does not work, so if you unplug the laptop, it dies. The battery doesn't even give you a millisecond of, of power when you unplug the laptop. So... That was Tuesday. Then we traveled for our anniversary. Wednesday was our... No, that was Monday. Sorry, I meant to get this up on Monday because we were leaving on Tuesday. We did leave on Tuesday. Thought we were going to have to cancel that trip if the power didn't come back on. Um, did leave on Tuesday. Wednesday was our 10th anniversary. We um, It's our 10th and our 12th anniversary. So I think I've probably mentioned before that we got married on the second anniversary of our first date. So this was our, uh, the 12th anniversary of our first date and the 10th wedding anniversary. And we went to Paris because it's only a two and a half hour flight now, which is just so cool and so crazy. And I have to take a sidebar here and say never... Not never in my wildest dreams, but if you'd asked me even a year ago if I thought that I would be in Spain one month, England the next month, and France the month after that, all while living in Portugal, I would have told you that you were crazy. No, this did not seem, that would not have seemed real to me, and yet that is what I have done this summer. So we went to Paris for our 10th anniversary. It was beautiful. It was amazing. We had so much fun. I loved it. Uh, We kept comparing it to our trip in London. Which do we like better? I don't know. I mean, there's so many reasons that we liked both and things that we were like, "Mm, not so sure about. I got to practice my French. I came home. I can't remember any Portuguese. (laughs) Actually, today I couldn't remember Portuguese, English, or French. doesn't matter. I I digress. (laughs) Um husband was having some pain during our trip off and on not too bad except that it kept getting progressively worse throughout the three days that we were in Paris he was a trooper but by the time we landed back in Portugal yesterday he was in excruciating pain we drove from the airport to the nearest hospital which was about 10 minutes away from the airport and uh, round two of a six-hour saga. The power was six hours. The emergency room was six hours. Lots of tests, some brilliant pain med- medication, and we got home about three o'clock this morning. And he's fine. We're not quite sure what's going on still, but he is doing better. Um, anyway, very very tired today. Not as tired as he is, because you know I didn't get shot up with a ton of pain medication that's made him sleepy. Uh, throughout the day. I was just tired because we got home at 3 a.m. That was our week. <laughs> a lot, some some highs, some lows, <laughs> some craziness. Yeah, Paris was beautiful though, and I'm really, really glad that we went. I'm really grateful that the hubby planned this for our 10th anniversary and just, wow, really never expected. Thought maybe I'd go to Paris someday. Didn't really expect it to be here for our 10th anniversary. Um, lots and lots of fun. 
that's not why we're here. I just wanted to give you a brief update. We are here to talk about a book. And in this case, it is called The Candid Life of Mina Dave. The author is Namrata Patel, and she was a delight to talk to. Let me go ahead and give you the description of the book. Mina Dave is a photojournalist and nomad. She has no family, no permanent address, and no long-term attachments, preferring to observe the world at a distance through the lens of her camera. But Mina's solitary life is turned upside down when she unexpectedly inherits an apartment in a Victorian brownstone, brownstone in historic Back Bay, Boston. Though Mina's impulse is to sell it and keep moving, she decides to use her journalistic instinct to follow the story that landed her in the home of a stranger. It's a mystery that comes with a series of hidden clues, a trio of meddling Indian aunties, and a handsome next-door neighbor. For Mina, it's a chance for newfound friendships, community, and culture she never thought possible, and a window into her past she never expected. Now, as everything unknown to Mina comes into focus, she must reconcile who she wants to be with who she really is. And that is the description of a candid, The Candid Life of Mina, Mina Dave. Um, I really enjoyed this book for so many reasons. The um, warmth and the humor with which it is told, the vibrancy of the characters they're just so well written you feel like you know all of them especially the trio of aunties oh my goodness they are they're 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 a character i, I they're they're three individual characters that combine to make one sort of definitely larger than life character that comes into mina's life and i'm not quite sure how i would handle the three aunties coming into my life the way they came into mina's but Mina herself is um, complicated, maybe not so much at first. I mean, she is, but at, at, in the beginning, she's pretty closed off. She's pretty convinced that uh, her life is the way she wants it, the way she, it needs to be, the way it's going to be, and that's not going to change. But then, of course, it does change. And I just, I really enjoyed um, the humor and the the issues around identity that are explored in the telling of this story as Mina tries to figure out why she was left this house, what it has to do with her life, what her relationship may or may not be with the person who left her this house, etc. So let's go ahead and turn to the interview and Namrata can tell you more about the book and how it came to be. So again, it's The, mean, the, the, mean, the Candid Life of Mina Tave by Namrata Patel. Hi, Namrata. Welcome to the podcast. I think I said it wrong. <laughs> Namrata. Hi, yes. Namrata. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. So nice to be here. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to talk about your book, um, The Candid Life of Mina Days. Before we get to the book, though, um, if you would share a little bit about yourself uh, before we start, I so my listeners can get to know you a little bit, that would be great. I'm a writer. I'm based in Boston, and I write commercial fiction, contemporary fiction, women's fiction, whatever you want to call it, book club fiction, um, mostly about Indian American experiences, um, assimilated and diaspora experiences. I live in Boston and I've um, been fortunate to live in multiple places, but I call the Northeast home. I was born in India, but I grew up in New Jersey. And then I've lived in Spokane. I've lived in London. I've lived in um, New York City, and now Boston is where I call home. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. I think my favorite part of that sentence was I've lived in London, I've lived in Spokane. Like for me, I grew up about two hours from Spokane. And that just does not, it just doesn't, doesn't go in a sentence with London. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's been uh it's been fun to have like such diverse living experiences. Spokane was definitely different as a yeah. person who grew up in the Northeast, but I really it's you know, uh near nature near perfect is its motto and it's really lovely and I got to experience um a different, you know, definitely a different perspective, a different way of of um seeing the world, it was a little bit smaller than the other places that I've lived in. And I was definitely the 
only diversity that I came across while mm-hmm. I was living there. So mm-hmm. that was also another interesting part of my experience living there. But I, I enjoyed my time there. And probably not at the beginning because I was like, where did I wind up? And then <laughs> I slowly, you know, that's what I read. The assimilation happens, right? You adapt because that's who we are generally. And that's that's one of the things that I value about my time in Spokane. And I still have friends there that I, that I am in touch with. Um, so it's been, it was great. <laughs> London was completely different than that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, I've been to both places and actually, you know, like, I, I, I would probably say I like London better, but I mean, Spokane <laughs> certainly has beautiful things and uh, I have well, an uncle. You're going to ask me to choose things about it. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to ask me to choose, I am going to pick London. Oh, right? yeah, I'm not going to blame you for that. <laughs> um, oh. All right, um, back to the book. Um, it's called <laughs> The Candid Life of Mina Days. Um, and actually, I like the title because there's some discussion in the book about her last name and how it's actually pronounced. But before we get to that, um, what was you? Uh, that, sorry, can you give an overview of the story? Yeah, it's about a woman who doesn't know who she is and she's a nomadic photojournalist who inherits an apartment in Boston and she has an idea of why because she was adopted she knew she was adopted and she was adopted by a family that was um, white and she has brown skin and she didn't know anything about it but she guessed well maybe this is connected to my birth And as she pokes a little bit into that story, because she is a photojournalist and she's curious by nature, she discovers lots of threads of connections that she has with that building, with the people in that building. And um, through it, it's really a story about, you know, found family or what makes a family, um, what it does it mean to be alone and what does it mean to belong? So there are several things that I wanted to really address uh, or think about or explore through this novel. And um, yeah, that's the book. I don't want to give too much away because it, the way the story flows and, you know, we'd have to say spoiler alert if for those readers that haven't picked it up, but um, yes. it's really just understanding who you are and what does it mean to know who you are? Yeah. There's, there's so much about identity in this book and what, again, identity in terms of family, identity in terms of heritage, identity in terms of culture. Um, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. And again, I don't want to give too much away either, but it's fascinating to watch Mina go through the process. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely a, you know, something that we all sort of feel in our lives, right. At any point of, point in time we struggle with our identity in terms of like who are we even to like the base level of um for me I'm like am I a planner or am I just like do I randomly go through life you know (laughs) or um what you know what we what I think of myself and what I want to be versus the true you know nature of me and how we evolve as we grow and how we evolve through the various experiences Mm -hmm. What was your initial inspiration for the story? Um, there are a couple of things. The inspiration was really coming across this article around Indian Americans who came to study at MIT in the 20s and 40s. And I was just fascinated by that. And the fact that I didn't know it as an Indian American, that this was a part of my cultural history. And I didn't had no idea that this happened. And then I you know, wondered like, what if they had stayed? What what would have their lives would have looked like? And what would their children and their children's children be? And it was a different sort of, you know, generational experience because I was born in India and I came here uh, and I grew up here. My parents came here as adults and, you know, their, their, experience and American experience is very different. My experience is very different. And, you know, people who came here, Indian Americans who came here in the 20s, 30s, their great grandchildren's experience would be tremendously different. So I wanted, I started thinking about that. And then when the pandemic came about, we sort of were all locked inside. And I want, I started thinking about, you know, what does community mean? And what about 
you know, all the people that were stuck in their apartments and homes by themselves and how do they, they find their community? Because as someone who's lived in mostly in cities, you know, you, you're surrounded by people. So you're out and about working, you're out and about uh, meeting friends and doing things and exploring and all of those things. Um, even if you were training or a cyclist or a runner, you had groups of people. So being alone and lonely were very different um, until the pandemic hit. And then you were sort of, you know, absent of all of that. And I won't say just just people who are alone, but even people, you know, with families, like we all just sort of stopped in time. And And I wondered what it would be like for someone who lived externally very much externally like Mina who wandered from place to place relying on others to fulfill her to be sort of stuck somehow and unable to do that and that's where like a lot of reckoning happens for us right and I don't know about you but I know these past three years have been very formative and I think societally they've been very formative so um i I wanted to explore that theme and that's where the idea of like uh, Mina came along and she was just really this didn't want to deal with anything except just going forward and looking ahead and seeing as much of the world and capturing other people's stories behind her camera to boom, you're stuck in this apartment and you're curious as to why, and you kind of want to leave, but you don't want to leave. And, um, it was just this this two convergence of two things converged at once that that really inspired this book. Okay, so now that you know a little bit more about the book and the inspiration behind it, etc., let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more about that immigrant experience of the 20s to the 40s, which I didn't know that much about, and I'm really glad that I got a glimpse into some of that um, through the telling of this story. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Namrata Patel about her book, The Candid Life of Mina Dave. Let's go ahead and return to that interview. You talk a little bit more about the the experience, uh, the, the immigrant experience in the, in the 20s to the 40s and um, the students who came to study at MIT. Is the engineer's house based on um, an actual residence or did you make that up out of your research? Yeah, no, it, I did make it up. <laughs> I wish it existed, but it doesn't. Um, you know, uh, Marlboro Street is a very uh, gorgeous street in Bo- in Back Bay area of Boston. And I love that street. I love walking down that street in different seasons. And I, you know, historically, it's been a predominantly white, wealthy area. And I thought, well, the immigrants that came over were were wealthy they had privilege right so they were able to afford to come study in at MIT and i thought what if they had um you know brought this house or somebody bought this house and five people there would be like a constant who welcomed the new students coming in and this was all just a fictional premise um but the house itself or the communal part of the house was based on the ways that um, I know 
uh, a lot of the collectivist cultures grow up where, you know, we came here in the 80s and we lived in an apartment building in Hoboken when Hoboken, New Jersey was affordable. Um, and majority of the families in that building were Indian American and the kid, like all the doors were open. The kids would go in, in and out of each other's houses. The aunties fed you, they disciplined you, they yelled at you, they like all of those things. Um, everybody was a parent. And even though you had your parents, like they relied on each other to, to have this communal experience for their families and their children. So I wanted to bring that into this place called the engineer's house where it was that sort of representative of, you know, it, what does make a family? Is it just nuclear? Is it the Western concept of, of, you know, individual families in their own houses behind locked doors, which is how we live versus this collectivist nature of um, having trust amongst each other and our neighbors to be able to say, well, um, I come home, but my parents are at work. So I'll go to my um, non-biological aunt's house and have cookies. Or <laughs> if I got into a fight at school, you know, when m the uncle that was free would come get me or something like that. So I wanted to, to bring that into this space. I, I was firmly on Mina's side at the beginning when she was locking her door. <laughs> I was like, I, I, that would have been foreign to me as well of just letting random, not right. Well, no, they are random at first, but letting people just walk they into my random, house. No, yeah. no. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it is a very difficult thing to ex um, accept, right? Particularly in light of the modern world where mm -hmm. safety and security is just so much at the forefront for women and um to just trust that there will be people in and out of this place yeah i mean everyone would hesitate and i think like the goal of the book was to show throughout the book that premise of like how do you build trust how do you accept how do you and sometimes you're pushed and sometimes you go willingly and these were the little moments for her to sort of feel safe in that place and trust again. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the aunties are a formidable trio. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit more about them and are they based on people? Are they composites of people, you know, are they based on people, you know, not that I'm expecting you to name drop, but um, yeah, <laughs> they're so vibrant. How, how did you create this trio? Yeah, you know, it the aunties, it's really interesting, particularly because if I juxtapose it with a lot of aunties in the um fictional spaces, particularly in, in they see uh fiction, they're like meddling and nosy, and those those are like sort of the stereotypes of aunties, right? And then um, but I wanted to layer in more of individuals so they're they're not necessarily composite of that nosiness or the the interference uh but i wanted to understand i wanted to like talk about these women as women but also as a trio and their friendship so originally the idea was really much very much about like the forbid form formidability of these aunties right and um we are going to pull you into this house kicking and screaming, whether you like it or not. But as, as the, you know, as I kept working on the book, I realized like they are individuals in their own right. And I wanted to make sure that they weren't necessarily representatives of a culture. They were sort of stand-ins for what maternal type nurturing looks like, if that makes sense. So how, you know, we in like in in uh, a lot of spaces, like um, women nurture collectively, right? But each within their own ways. And in this case, the three of them who are very very different, but they are very ride or die with each other, um, found different ways to pull Mina along through her journey, and then in turn, they were also like touched by it in various different ways. 
so that they had to to evolve to a to a place where not as much as uh, Mina did, but they had to come to terms with all of this and how they were involved in it. Um, but they are definitely, uh, they were my favorite as much as I loved Mina. I was like, oh, these were <laughs> friendship goals. These were the aunties that like, you know, I had, I have a lot of aunties and there's pieces here and there, but then there's also, they're just very, very, very unique to the story. <laughs> mm-hmm. Actually, they were, they were, well, they're, I mean, they're a delight because you, you are by turns laughing with them at them uh, and just frustrated with them also. But um, I have a friend who is like, I kept seeing little bits of all the aunties in this friend that I have. And sometimes she drives me crazy because she is a little bit like, you know, the aunties are like, don't lock your door. They just come in, they start cleaning their boss and are around. And there are times when this friend just drives me up the wall because she's like that, <laughs> but she's also <laughs> got that loving side and that nurturing side. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, the aunties are my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know your friend, but I'm glad <laughs> that you, you found a way to understand your friend, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it, it helped. But, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously, I it, she's not exactly, but um, there were times right. when I was like, yes, okay, this makes sense. <laughs> um, but how about, how about Mina and, and the, that character? What about her do you think will resonate with readers? Um, you know, she is she's quiet, right? She's a quiet heroine. She's not somebody who is going to be like uh, absolutely a force of nature at the start of the book. Um, But she is, she is strong mentally, but she is very fragile emotionally. And I think that's what a lot of people connect with because, um, you know, particularly, I, I will say I'm an introvert. So maybe I, I'm biased in that, but I think particularly introverts where feelings and expressing feelings aren't necessarily at the forefront of any conversation. And it takes a mm-hmm. while to warm up to people. Um, and so there, there are a lot of people out there who wouldn't go in and just with their heart open to every situation and every experience. Right. And she's very much resistant, not just because of the emotional trauma, but because of the nature of how she has lived uh, her adult life and this idea of like, I'm just going to keep things to myself and I'm not necessarily going to share or be vulnerable in spaces until I build trust. And then the, the other part of it is like this yearning that I think a lot of people, a lot of readers can connect to, which is that when you're on the outside looking in, you want to be a part of that, right? As much as I don't want to keep my door open or as much as Mina doesn't want to keep her door unlocked, she welcomes the idea as the book progresses because there is sort of this like am i being am i a part of this now am i in the sort of in group right or am i like um cared for and nurtured and do i allow that so i and you know all of us want to find a place where we belong right i think that's the the biggest connection point for this story we all need to and want to be a part of a community um even the the most like off grid of us <laughs> will find points of connection uh whether it's to nature or or to um other people so i think that those are the the parts of mina that readers really respond to yeah absolutely um as an introvert who married into a very, very vocal family. I completely relate to Mina on, on some on some <laughs> levels. Um, did you do any particular types of research for the book? Um, yes, um, obviously, um, a lot of the diaspora type mm-hmm. research, um, mm-hmm. identity and belonging. I in my graduate work um, a while ago, and I still continue to research what. Um, East West dynamics and diaspora are um, intergenerational um, in East West cultures, tensions are and things like that. Um, So lots of articles, lots of academic research. Um, And I also did um, very, (laughs) um, I also had to research being a photojournalist. I am not a photojournalist. I can barely take up 
photo with my iPhone. So it is um, something that I had to really rely on. And, and a friend of mine, uh, Holly Pickett, who is uh, an incredible photojournalist, and she, I met her in Spokane, actually, and she's, you know, um, New York Times, LA Times, NPR. Uh, she's just a very well um, experienced photojournalist and she'd been my, by my side teaching me all the things. So that was really, really uh, helpful and important to me. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, um, character research. So uh, Quiet, the book, if you're an introvert, you'll know the book Quiet. <laughs> you just sort of, you know, what the psychological makeup is of that. Um, so yeah, a pockets of research here and there to to make the story as rich as possible. And you mentioned character research. So when it comes to character development, how much do you like to do before you start writing? And then how much evolves? I feel like the empties maybe evolved as you wrote. Oh yeah, they, <laughs> they took over actually. The first draft was really very much um, a character sketch for Mina. And the aunties were there just as a vehicle to uh, more like blocking, right? Like they were there to set the scene or they were there as a propeller for something uh, until they became their own per uh, own characters in a sense with their full lives. Um, as far as Mina, I, um, I need to have a sense of who the, who she is as a person and how like, and this is this is not necessarily research. It's just I'm a Mueller. So it, the she'll live. She lived in my head for a few months where I'm like, well, how would she have grown up? Like what, you know, what would her high school years been like? Would she have friends? And then, you know, after this traumatic experience, like would she distance herself or would she um, rely on her high school friends to help her and uh, those are the types of things I mull. And then once I have like a pretty good sketch, <clears throat> I'll look at how those traits like narrow down. And I, I look at things like the emotional thesaurus or um, some ac uh, academic articles and, you know, psycho psychology articles on the makeup of what it would be like to go through something traumatic if you had these traits and what are some of the, because nothing is universal, right? Everything is subjective. And that is the beauty of fiction is that you can then really have this full rich character that is just unique. That is not a, a caricature or of, of any one thing or any um, mixture of things. It's just unique to their experiences. So I, I, have a good idea. I start writing about the character. I start writing and then I learn all the way through the the draft. And then I have to go back and say, is this who I thought it was? And more often than not, it's not <laughs> because the character grows and evolves through the, through the story. And then I'll do some additive um, research. My, uh, the things that I don't do, <laughs> which come in the very last draft is like, what does she look like? What color hair? Because <laughs> I live so much in the internal life of the character that that the the last part are the traits, like the physical traits, um, and even the movement, like the phys physicality of the character. Like, you know, does she wear her backpack on her right shoulder? Is she right handed, and she's using a camera. And you know, if you know, in the piece of the story where she hurts her arm and it's like it, would she still be able to function as a photojournalist and the physicality of those things come in last jumping in here so we can take our second break of the podcast we're going to be continuing this conversation about character development so stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
Life. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Namrata was talking about character development and putting in defining characteristics of a person's appearance at the end uh, on the final draft, which I thought was interesting. So um, that was the context. So my next question is going to make more sense. Yeah, I guess I never thought about putting those in later. Um, that's interesting. I know most of the time you start with like, Oh, what is, you know, she's five, eight, she's got, Mm -hmm. but usually my, (laughs) um, and a lot of the, the, um, because it's a third person close POV that I'm using, it's also hard to be like, and my black hair is tied up in a bun. Like those things are not comfortable for me right. to write yeah. <laughs> because I, it, it takes me out of the story. So I feel like it takes the reader out of the story. And it's usually when the editor comes in and says, um, I'm on, I'm on page 150 and I still don't know what she looks like. So I'm like, Oh, right. that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a fine balance. Cause sometimes I, sometimes I have an image in my head and, and then they'll be described and I'm like, Oh wait, okay. So that's not what I was picturing. But then also when it's, especially if it's written from like a first person point of view and they say, yeah. I'm five, four, I have brown hair. Like that takes you out of the story too. Cause I'm like, why are you yeah. telling, I know why you're telling me about yourself, but it's still weird. <laughs> and you know, and the more you read and the more you write, like you start learning how others do it. Right. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and then you, you find the tricks of like, Oh, you know, he must be like three feet tall, three inches taller than me. So likely six, three. And then the reader infers that the character is less than right. three yes. inches less. You know, yes. something yeah, like there's that. ways to do it. But um, yeah. that's fascinating. When it comes to autobiographical elements within your writing, um, are there things that you deliberately include? Are there things that you deliberately avoid? Do those things sort of flow naturally? How does that work for you? Yeah, um, you know, there, there, I am the one writing the story. So there's obviously parts of me that are in the book. It, there's, I don't think there's intentionality to omit anything. I, I like to, this is not my story. This is Mina's story. This is, you know, there are not a lot of, besides the identity, there's not a lot of markers that are shared. Um, but the, again, because it's such an introspective sort of story for Mina, that those parts, like, I do take um, a while to warm up to people, or I do take a while to trust, or I do, uh, I am not necessarily going to walk into a room and be the life of the party. I do try to fix things on my own. Um, You know, so those are the things that come in, but not necessarily like, Oh, you know, I will tell you the one significant, not significant, but one thing that I did put in that is very much me, which was um, the planner piece where like, I just don't um, use planners. And uh, as much as people try to tell me to use planners or get me to use planners, I don't. And then that was one of the things that were part of that I had to put in there as a little thing for me. (laughs) Well, but in this day, I mean, you you don't use any kind of planner like uh, obviously a lot of people no longer use paper planners but you don't use like the calendar on your phone or anything i have a calendar i have a work calendar so um for my meetings and things and then when i have things i'll put it on there but i am not someone who like i love these incredible planners um that are so beautiful and like paper planners 
and I collect them, but I, I will spend like a week planning my week. And then that is the one time I use that planner. (laughs) Everything else is chaos. (laughs) So um, I have uh, friends who are like, very much planner people and they write their tasks and to do's and I'm still very much mental in my like, Mm -hmm. okay, here are three things I have to do. And I just carry them in my head because I have this thing that if I write it down, I'm going to forget. And then I'm going to forget to look at the planner and then I'm not going to, I'm just going to miss it all together. So if I keep it in my head, I know I have to remember it. And these are the tricks you play with yourself, right? Right. (laughs) So, yeah. I saw a meme on Facebook, I think the other day, and it was about writers and it said things that all writers have. And it was like 32 beautiful notebooks that you never write in. (laughs) So (laughs) that's you. It's just with planners. Yes. I have um, journals and planners and um, mine isn't that they don't have anything written in. They just the first page is full and then the rest (laughs) of it is completely empty. And um, even for work, like I have, um, I'm not a linear note taker. So I have, you know, if I have a clean page on my notebook, there's like in the left corner, there's a note in the middle, there's a note, there's a note in the the right bottom corner. Like none of it makes sense except to my brain. <laughs> so. Yep. Well, it's your secret code. No one will ever figure it out. <laughs> I could be more organized. It's one of those things where like, I want to be more organized. You can't make myself get there. <laughs> Yeah, I let every yeah, you gotta do what works for you. Yeah. Um, so are you working on a new project right now? I am. I'm um almost uh done revising my second book, which is The Scent of a Garden, and it's out next uh it is out in June 2023, and it is about a perfumer who loses her sense of smell. And um, she has to figure out what's next for her because of, you know, um, what she thought was her one passion isn't viable anymore. And uh, I wanted to try to explore. It's part of this, like, again, this change in the past three years where we're really questioning what our passion is and, you know, whether we inherited these things or whether, um, we chose them. And then what does that mean? And it's pers- particularly if you're almost at the pinnacle of your career, and then you have to make an adjustment. And what does that mean? And how do you sort of reconcile with that? So yeah, it's a fun, it <laughs> doesn't sound like it, but it's a fun book. <laughs> no, I bet, I bet it was interesting. Like that, I'm sure that was some interesting research, but it also makes me think, you know, those of us, those, I did not lose my sense of smell when I had COVID, but I know lots of people who did and, you know, the, the complaining, but well, what if your, what if your actual livelihood depended on that? That's fascinating. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited for that. And it's, um, it takes place in Napa, which is, in, you know, oh, yeah. a different setting to explore mm-hmm. that. Oh, fun. Yeah. In terms of writing, is it something that you always wanted to do or something that you decided later in life how did you come to decide to write for publication I um I came to it a little bit later I was always a big reader um all through you know ever since I could read I read um I just never thought I could be a writer because I never saw myself in books and you know if you don't see yourself I grew up you know in a um, very working class type uh, situation. So I didn't have much in terms of representation. I was reading library books and it was like from Ramona Quimby to Judy Bloom to, you know, um, a lot of um, white authors with white characters. And I just thought like, okay, well, this is what I read in America, but I didn't think I could write that because I didn't think I was allowed to. And um, until I, you know, after college, I started reading and seeing more books about in with Indian American authors about Indian Americans. And I was like, hey, I have all these stories too. And um, I took, you know, I, I started writing and I was like, ooh, I don't even know what I'm doing because you learn English composition, right? You don't necessarily um, in college particularly. So 
and I started taking community college writing, creative writing classes. And then I, I did some more with Gotham writers and just continued to learn how to do it. And it wasn't until about, um, you know, and I wrote like really bad poetry. I wrote incredibly long plotless novels um all of them were just practice right and then um about 10 years ago when I was like no I I I'm ready I can do this as a career um and I started I mean I always pitched and I always collected rejection letters and I always queried but it wasn't until about 10 years ago when like I started putting craft and the business of publishing together and learning as much as I could um towards this sort of uh you know vocation for for lack of a better word and then um it was still very much uphill because then you were you I couldn't tell if the rejections I were I was collecting were craft based or market based meaning diverse stories still weren't a thing for a while and um even then and even now it's just still a small space and um even five years ago there was like one indian author per imprint so when you go you know when you get rejections no one's going to say oh it's because your story is indian although i did get some rejections or like this is too ethnic for me but um you so it's hard to improve it's hard to like say well what do i do because it's not a craft thing right if someone said oh uh, this pacing isn't working for me or the plot isn't working for me. Those are things I can enhance and and I can learn and grow from, but it's just, um, this is very well written. It's just, I don't know what to do with it. Or this is very well written. I just can't relate to the characters. Like those were the types of things that you just, you know, you're like, okay, is this ever going to happen? And then about right. four years ago, I signed um, with Sarah Younger, who, you know, she was like, there is a market, your writing is, you know, it's the first time someone who is not your friend or not um, someone who cares about you says like, your writing is good, <laughs> you know, and you can believe them because they are in the industry and they're not, they're not necessarily coming from a place of like, they're coming from a place of honesty because they're your partner. Right. And so, um, working with her and we went through um three rounds of submissions for three different books that didn't sell and that you know I, again it was like we couldn't pinpoint if it was the craft or if it was the market and um and then it just you know this one was like really a confluence of a lot of things and I think my right I, you know I'm I'm very self-aware, like my writing did significantly improve, improve with each, each rejection, right. In the, in the last four years. And then the concept has to be there. So it's not enough just to be like, I want to tell an Indian American story. Like you have to have some sort of a concept around that. And um, someone has to see potential, not in the art, but in the commerce of it to be like, there is an audience for this, or we can market this, or we can, we can try to find a place on the shelves, the, the, the fictional shelves, because the shelves are online uh, for a lot of, a lot of uh, books now, but virtual shelves, not fictional shelves. But, um, and so that, that's sort of the journey that evolved. And, um, you know, uh, I just had to balance this thing about, am I good enough a writer versus, you know, is it just because of the types of book I, books I wanted to write? I will say I did, um, before I signed with Sarah, I did uh, enter a contest with a novel um, that had all white characters. Uh, it was set in the Pacific Northwest. It was three survivors of an, there were adults who had experienced an elementary school shooting when they were children um, and explored the trauma of that as adults. And when I when I so went on submission, the the number one comment I got was like, "But you're not white. How are you writing this story?" And I thought, "Okay, I cry, Uncle." Now, oh my gosh, yes. Oh, that has got to be so. I'm so frustrated on your behalf right now. Like, yeah, just, what do you want? I'm like, okay, 
but you know, I, I, I live in this country. I understand school shootings. I understand right. trauma. I can yeah. research. Like I just, it was just, um, I can laugh about it now. But it has been a journey, right? Uh-huh. Um, get to this place. <laughs> final break of the podcast when we come back uh namrata's advice for aspiring authors so stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back golden state media concepts social media podcast time to hashtag everything we talk about all the fun crazy stories on social media from instagram to facebook twitter to tumblr or probably even friendster join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media it's the golden state media concept social media podcast it's simple it's simple such a sad song the one that the one that we rely on Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Namrata Patel. Yes. Do you, from your experience, have advice for aspiring authors, especially BIPOC aspiring authors, because there's still a large, a long uphill battle for getting more diversity and more representation in writing? Yeah, I think I would say... um, I would say a couple of things. One is um, how determined are you? Because there are, it is okay if you, if the system is too uh, restricted to, to get your foothold in and then you, you can stop, right? Like perseverance is a, is a thing and not everyone wants to sort of do that. And, you know, I've always been like practice patience and perseverance are my three things that are the three pillars that I, I lean into. And the, uh, so I'll say like perseverance is one practice is the other, regardless of the types of stories you want to tell. I really do think particularly for BIPOC authors, you have to hone the craft because the expectation, the standard setting, the, the competition um, is just so, so high that you have to continue to continue to, even if you have like the most amazing concept, you really owe it to the readers as well as yourself to like really work on the craft Um, because it also prevents like, you know, in, in the face of all the, all of those rejections and feedback, I, I did not want to take on the mindset that I am being rejected solely based on my identity right like because I refuse to be a victim of anything so I'm like all right if not this then this if not this then this and I just continue to try to to um keep working towards the goal that I I finally decided I wanted and then um patience because um you can you know uh, with the advent of uh, not yet, but the, uh, the way indie publishing is going, like you can put your stuff out there and that is a very valid and important choice. And you will find readers and you will find your audience. If you're looking at the traditional path, or if you're looking for um, that aspect of publishing, then patience is really key because I'm sure, you know, as you, as you interview so many different authors, like, once you go out on submission and into that void, like you are just waiting, <laughs> you're waiting at every turn, you're waiting at the query stage, you're waiting at the submission stage, you're waiting at the publication stage. And um, in that waiting, you know, what are you doing towards that next thing? And I'm not saying I'm like constantly thinking about what's next or what I'm writing. I mean, I took four days, the last four days, I did not a single word of writing (laughs) just sort of lived my life but it is it is this um thing that you have to keep at the forefront of your mind if this is the path you want to go to so tldr patience practice perseverance (laughs) Mm -hmm. and 
you know, as some as some people do prefer to do the traditional publishing route. They, they you know, that's that's their goal. That's their what they want to do. But I am grateful for the the fact that the, that indie publishing, self publishing, is more readily available now because you get yeah. more voices in the market. So you can see people like yourself in your books. Yeah. And you know what's um, interesting, and I'm sure you're following the DOJ PRH Simon Schuster trial. Um, it Like, I think that um, the readers are hungry for as much as um, they can get their hands on, right? So the, the, gates aren't necessarily because of the the readers aren't there the gates are there because there are people in conference rooms and boardrooms deciding what the readers want or should want and that's where like i think the that you know indie publishing has gone in full steam and said well you know i have i have someone who's going to read 300 books a year and i'm going they're going to read five of mine in that 300 books a year and I'm not going to let the the traditional publishing schedule and track deter me from that so I think like even the the traditional publishers are seeing that there is a voracious appetite it's just the structures that they've put in place um aren't as agile for them to be able to sort of turn uh towards this right you you go where your audience is and in this case they're trying to still force the audience to be what they want the audience to be if that makes sense Mm -hmm. yeah so um yeah and people argue well you know there's just some not great books out there with that have been self-published and i want to say there's some not not great great books books (laughs) right (laughs) so you're gonna find typos everywhere there's a typo in candid life of Luna that i've been made aware of (laughs) oh i'm sure people are so worried about that um yeah yeah um anyway um it is uh you know what the the benefit for me particularly is like um because there's so many experts in traditional publishing that have like volumes of experience, I've been a beneficiary of that. So like the editorial process, the, co- the from developmental to copy to line, um, the production process, like all of those things I can, that are be that, that are navigated on my behalf that I learn from and benefit from. And I think that's, that's like the, the thing that I really value about the traditional space, right? The, I mean, editors edit hundreds of books and they can um, see very quickly what the holes are, the discrepancies, the missing pieces in your book, and you can um, learn from that. So I, I, I don't mean to like disparage the traditional publishing in that sense, just the business side needs to sort of figure it out (laughs) to accommodate the readers right right well even in the sense of genres how we can't have cross genre books because it's so confusing to like traditional publicists uh, or publishers I don't understand that it's not that complicated readers have figured it out you know readers are like sure I'll read I'll read a YA sci-fi paranormal ghost story (laughs) like (laughs) yeah Yeah. set in the past (laughs) exactly yes set in steampunk era like <laughs> exactly. yeah they don't have a problem but um in terms of reading and you did mention that you are a voracious reader what do you like to read who are your go-to authors and genres um yeah <laughs> this is gonna be a weird answer i really like to read nonfiction. <laughs> it's just a sponge for nonfiction. so i'll read um anything by eric weiner i'll read I so, would like just random books, uh, Ed Young's new book, Immense World, or um, anything that has like a niche type interesting concept, like, you know, Salt, the story of Salt, or like Guns, Germs, and Steel, or I like s- some of that stuff. In terms of fiction, um, my go-to genre for when I just want to be in a happy place is romance. I love reading romance. I love love stories. Um, and then um, for, 
I won't say for work because I do enjoy it, but I do read uh, commercial fiction, any, you know, from Matt Haig's Midnight Library and How to Stop Time to some of the, um, you know, wh whoever's on the top. Uh, lists right now that are writing out there in commercial fiction. I I can't think of anything off the top of my head that I'm reading in that space just because I don't read um, that when I'm writing or editing just because I, I need to stay in the space of my novel and not be in another person's, another author's novel. So I'll read nonfiction when I'm writing. And then when I'm in between breaks, I'll, I have a list of all of the readers, all of the um, books on my TBR pile, as they say, mm -hmm. uh, and get through them. But I, I do have a stack of those, including like Kate Claiborne has a new one out, um, or I might have an arc of that I'm looking forward to reading. And then um, uh, Somia Dave has a couple of books out that I read that I really enjoyed, Well-Behaved Indian Women. Um, uh I just discovered, and I did not know because it's hard to find an uh, Indian American commercial fiction, women's fiction writers, but Madi uh, Sinha, who wrote the White Coat Diaries, I just discovered her. So I just ordered her books, but I haven't started. I uh, haven't started reading it. So yeah. All right. And then my, like, then I reread a lot because yeah. some of the comfort reads, I don't know about you, but like the pandemic, I'm like, I just want to know the ending and mm -hmm. I just want to know what the story is so that I don't have to stress about it. So I'll reread a lot of books. <laughs> yeah. Comfort reading. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Um, how about the internet presence, um, website yeah. and social media that you're present? You're yes. Present. I'm at N-A-M-P-A-T-E-L, nampatel.com. And then you can find all of my social media handles there. I'm more active on Instagram and then a little less on Twitter and then very infrequently on Facebook. Um, I have not ventured into the TikTok space yet, but I do have a TikTok and um, yeah. And events calendar is also on my website. So I'm really um, happy to be doing a few events and a few festivals coming up that are uh, nice to just like get some instant feedback, uh, face to face. So, uh, those, those are fun. Oh, TikTok! It's the time stuff <laughs> of my life. <laughs> well, so that's the problem. I have to limit when mm -hmm. I go on because what, then you start and then you look up and it's 45 minutes later and you're like, yeah. what happened? Yeah. <laughs> No, I completely understand. I'll, I'll, I'll just five minutes. I have five minutes. Oh shoot. That was an hour. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. I think TikTok has taken over. What was it like bird, angry birds and candy crush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I'll think I could be reading. What am I doing? Why am I on TikTok? Yeah. And did you experience in the, the last three years, like Heart, your attention span just got shorter for like sitting down and reading. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a slog and I, I can't put my, I can't understand why, <laughs> you know, because I could spend a weekend read. I used to be able to spend an oh, entire yeah. weekend reading. Yeah. And, and I know now, that COVID can cause brain fog, but I didn't have COVID until a couple months ago and I, I was still having this issue. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, I've had, uh, I've been fortunate. I don't know if I've had it, but I haven't had it aware. Like, mm -hmm. I, and I still am like, start a book. And then three pages later, I'm like, yep, nope, got to do something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Um, well, we, we have talked about a lot of different things, um, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to mention at this point? Um, no, I just, I really appreciate your time. And I, I think it was a great conversation and I'm, I'm around for my, for anyone who has any questions beyond this on my social channels, I'm happy to chat more about this book, the next book writing, or just the you know, um, how to navigate these spaces. I, I, because it was so difficult to try to understand publishing 
um, and it took years. I try to be as transparent as possible about the process. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all. I'll leave you with that is if you want some candid information, you can <laughs> message me. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time and I had a lot of fun. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you once again to Namrata for joining me to have a really fun conversation about the candid life of Mina Dave. I so enjoyed talking to her. And as I said at the beginning, um, loved the character development, especially of Mina throughout the story. Loved the, the aunties. Um, there's a dog in the book. So, you know, if that's something that you look for when reading a book, there is a cute little puppy. He is not well behaved at the beginning. <laughs> he goes through his own character arc of chewing things. Um, so if you look, if you like, do- if you like um, dogs in your books, then, then there's another perk to this one. <laughs> but thank you again to Namrata for sharing this story and sharing her inspiration for the story and the writing of it, etc. Um, I hope you'll join me for the next episode. We are switching gears to short stories. I'll be speaking with Erica Plouffe Lazur, and I'm realizing as I look at that that I'm going to definitely have to double check on the pronunciation of her name. If I butchered it, I apologize. Um, But I will be speaking with Erica about Proof of Me and other stories. Again, that is a collection of short stories. So join me for that. In the meantime, as always, if you're a fan of this podcast, do all of those lovely things. Or, you know, I'm asking you to do all those things. I'm not ordering you to do all those things. <laughs> it's a, it's not an imperative. It's a request. Um, like, follow, subscribe, etc. on whatever pod- podcast platform you listen to so that you can get the episodes as soon as they come out. If you have not done so, a review is very, very helpful. Starred or written, great. Helps to get this podcast out to lots of other readers and writers and listeners. And then follow on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Love hearing from you, love interacting with you. So if you have any questions or if you want to talk about what books you're reading currently um, or anything at all to do with books and other fun topics. We don't just have to talk about books, but thank you as always for joining me. Join me next time. In the meantime, I hope you have a great weekend planned. I hope we're just going to rest and recover from this week, which was again, up, down, crazy, fun, crazy. Uh, So uh, hopefully that will involve a lot of rest. Hopefully your weekend will involve lots of things that you love doing. And if reading is one of those things, then I definitely hope that your weekend gives you plenty of time to get yourself, get yourself lost in a good book or 10. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.